Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Oh, all right. Welcome to Stoa. Um, I'm Peter, student of Stoa. Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge. And we got the beautiful, sexy, and hot Akira the Dawn. Um, and then uh, he's doing, uh, we're going to do a quick Q&A, 30 minutes. Um, and then we're going to jump into another link. We're going to put it in the chat box. And then we're going to have a live stream party with Akira. Yeah. So uh, that being said, uh, Akira, how you doing, man? Beautiful days to be alive here at the peak of recorded human civilization, my guy. <laughs> how about you? you I'm doing good. Yeah, we had the um, uh, full day of Peterson uh, Fest here. We had leftists coming in. We had uh, activists coming in. We just watched the film, um, the the rise of Jordan Peterson. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, yeah, I digged it. You, I can't, I can't hear because you, you keep uh, your voice keeps uh, going in and out. Try turning it up. How's that? Yeah, that's good. I better. Had you seen it before? No, first time. Oh. Yeah. What was the feeling it left you with? Um, I missed him. Uh, I was telling because he was my therapist for two years. I think I told you that. And then so um, uh, I just like fuck. Where's Peterson? Like I want him back. Yeah. 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 And I think I saw a couple of tweets that you're saying that that too. Oh, I mean, I'm seeing that all over the place. Obviously, but obviously, you know, I'm I'm kind of I have a lot of uh, people who love Peterson uh, in my audience and connected to me and what have you. So I see that every day. Every day I see that. But I find it interesting with the film. Because I saw the film like before the departure or before the, the awareness of the departure, if that makes sense. And I was monitoring people's reactions to it. And depending on like your viewpoint, you, people were getting completely different vibes from the film. Some people, it scared them. Like some people were quite terrified at the end. Some people got this kind of like, like dark thing from it. It was really, I think it was very kind of well made in that it didn't present itself in any fashion other than being a document and then you essentially you see in it what your you see the reflection as in you see your own biases or what have you coming through and you get and you can kind of it's, it was impartial i felt yeah yeah and, yeah yeah because if you go if you search reactions around twitter some people were terrified by it some people saw a very clear document of a deliberate like messiah type thing being built deliberately huh. And they, and, got, they wanted to see out of that documentary. Yeah, yeah. And what did you get out of it? Um, I felt like it was the first part of a beautiful trilogy. <laughs> you know, we talk about this stuff, you know, and everything's in stories and it makes complete sense that your boy Peterson would have his whole life become a sort of archetypal story. It was like the first Star Wars movie, right? Yeah. And you got, um, you basically launched the Meaning Wave thing with Peterson. So yeah, he was, um, the first song I did that you would call Meaning Wave, I did lots of proto Meaning Wave my, my whole life. I made songs that sampled people talking. Uh, but the first song that you would call Meaning Wave was indeed a song that sampled Jordan Peterson talking about the importance of uh, being a really good plumber. You, you know? which really struck me at four in the morning, half baked, coming back from DJing in West Hollywood one night and switching on YouTube on a projector and uh, a Jordan Peterson uh, lecture being on. And he suddenly starts talking about, you know, be a plumber, but be a good one. And that really hit me. <laughs> that really hit me. I was like, damn, I need to sample this right now. That's just epic. Be a plumber, be a good one. Cause it, I don't know, it was something about him talking about the importance of just like, you know, just doing an honest thing. And the, the power of that in the world, it seems, like in, it seems like an odd thing that would be the thing that would really spark complete inspiration, but it did. Mm. And I put three things out that week. And one of them was that. And one of them was a track that sampled uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Uh, all you had to do was follow the damn train, CJ, which some people may know. And uh, another song about the Welsh notion of Hiraith, which is a kind of nostalgia for a place that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, mm. yeah, those three songs, and uh, that one was the one that really fucking resonated. With mm. me. And uh, yeah, so I began that journey. So I have a, um, 
uh, two questions and I have a strategy I want to share with you. Uh, if, if everyone has any questions, just write in the chat box or any statements and then I'll call on you and mute yourself. Um, so the first question, then I'll, make, I'll share the strategy is, um, so we're talking, okay, so I, I mentioned this in the last session that, so I saw Peterson as a client for two years and then the last, my last session with him was when he uh, um, released a pronoun video actually, it just worked out like that and then he just became famous. Um, just before I saw him, I started seeing him as a client. So basically two years before he became famous, I was saying to a buddy of mine, like, how come this guy is not more famous right now? Because he was in Toronto, he was like an indie band, like, you know, people kind of knew him, but he wasn't that, that popular. Then now it's like, how, how is this guy this fucking famous? It just, just like, yeah, he's, he says, he's, he says things that are good, but it's like, it's not like, like, like groundbreaking in a way, but it's like, there's like a combination of, of, of things about him that makes him special. So, I'm curious what your thoughts have been, why Peterson was the guy that had such a force in this culture and had such controversy and polarization around him. Well, it's the thing I always say, and people, people forget, certain people having these sorts of conversations, forget that it's pointless to preach to the choir. You wanna reach the normies and you wanna reach uh, people outside the choir. And uh, Peterson had a way of communicating quite complex, epic, ideas uh, to regular people in a way that they could understand and in a way that they felt was genuine. He's not talking down to you. Uh, he's not talking in a way uh, that's overtly unnecessarily complicated. Uh, he has a way of boiling down quite big ideas into concepts that, are, that you can grip if you're re like a regular person, you know? Uh, so he had that going for it. And then on the other side, he had this wonderful knack of getting into some kind of epic drama every week, you know, which uh, that's the milkshake that brings all the boys to the yard, you know, right. is that epic drama. So you'd be in a new beef every week and he'd be getting, a, he got a new super villain enemy to fight every week. So, you know, that became exciting and then people would go in. So some people would tune in for the drama, but then they would stay for the epic back catalog of bangers. That was his YouTube channel that was stuffed full of lectures of like four years worth of lectures, right? Mm -hmm. Talking about like just breaking down the Bible in terms that atheists could understand. Like he reintroduced uh, Western culture to two generations of people who didn't know nothing about it. Which is why I often compare him with Watts because Watts, in Watts introduced Eastern culture to people who didn't know nothing about it. And then you had two generations of Western people who didn't really have Western culture explained to them in a way other than it's bad, okay, you know? And he came in and he sort of tried, like in a similar way, say that like Joseph Campbell came in and translated things. He translated old things in a way that made sense now. And Peterson did something similar, but he had the added bonus of all that drama. He did the 50 cent thing. I've said this before, but he used exactly the same playbook that 50 cent did. And six, nine more recently. And um, like to continue something we talked about a previous conversation we had, like, so when I was his, his, his uh, client, he used to go to his office and he had all these books. And then the, the bookshelf to the right had this whole section on hell, on serial killers, evil, all this type of stuff. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Um, and, uh, and when I sort of like, uh, I was talking to you, like I'm following this uh, energy, I'm calling the daemon. And then like the daemon sort of leads you to like demonic energies. And uh, you actually feel like when you're following that, it's like, it sounds a woo to some people, but it's like this primordial language that you're speaking. Um, and Peterson speaks that language, I feel. It's like you feel his fucking words where all these sort of like disembodied intellectuals are just talking from like a monotone space. And I feel you're plugged into that primordial language as well. Um, or you can- Right? Say, say again? It's the conduit thing. Yes. Like you become, if, you, if, you, if you get into that zone, or if you get good enough at a thing, and if you focus, off, focus enough on that thing and doing that thing, you know, he, he, what, do you spend 40 years thinking about the same fucking thing in incredibly obsessive detail and reading everything about it? I've spent decades on this music thing in a similar way. And if you just keep doing that, you become a conduit for something. Alan Moore used to call it idea space or whatever. Uh, Grant Morrison calls it the fifth dimension, whatever. Like you become a conduit to, to that, whatever that is. And if you are pure in your intention or what have you, that just comes through and people will fucking recognize that. And it's undeniable. And it's also something that can't be copied. Yes. That's what happened with the IDW thing. Lots of people tried to like get that, get that. 
but they couldn't because they were not fucking conduits in that fashion for whatever reason. It's like not a thing. It's not a thing you can copy and it's not a thing you can do over the course of a weekend. Yeah. I like that. Some people are born that way and some people study and some people have an accident. It's like what are any kind of superpower, you know, someone falls into a vat of acid, you know, somebody builds a fucking machine and spends a long time doing it. Someone has some cosmic rays or whatever the fuck it is, or someone's born a mutant. Hmm. So here's the, the, the strategy. Uh, I agree with that, by the way. Uh, but here, here's the, uh, the strategy. Um, so Jordan Hall reached out to John Verveke and I, um, and this is, it was a lot of synchronicities uh, surrounding this. And the idea is to get Peterson into a uh, private conversation in Dialogos with John and a few other people in the sense-making web before he enters into uh, the sort of the culture war or whatever, if we can kind of do that move. Uh, in order to push him at his edge of his thinking into faces, maybe postmodern shadows or whatever it is. Um, and I have a sense that, uh, I don't know if, if you could help with that, but anything that resonates with you with that strategy? Uh, what, has anyone spoken to him? Has anyone, like where is oh. he currently at or what have you, or what his, his re-entry plan is or anything like that? People are aware where he's at, but they don't know what his re-entry plan is. Yeah. Yeah, and I yeah, think we. I can definitely put yeah. I'll I'll put put some words in. Uh, I mean, if you want to, any more specifics about topics or anything of that nature, or, or the way you would like to do it, or whatever forum or whatever, whatever kind of thing it is. I know he's already homies with Vivaki anyway, right? Yeah, so they have like a frenemy type relationship. Uh, they were like buddy. He, they were like the two. There was another guy, Dan Dolderman. They were like the three life changing professors at the University of Toronto. Uh, and then Verveke and Peterson, they had a lot of disagreements, but there was respect. And then Peterson just, and then Verveke just started coming on the scene recently in sort of a kind of a sense making rebel wisdom space with his meaning crisis series that you've been listening to. Yeah, which is epic. And there's a lot of crossover. Yeah. There, there is mucho crossover. I saw uh, there was a thing they did together. Did you see? Uh, a while ago. Yeah, that's before he, he launched, got launched on the, the culture war scene. Is it? Is that yeah. all? Great, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, and uh, so could, before I pivot to the Q and A, uh, steal the culture. Uh, think we can do it? Oh, you're gonna love it. <laughs> it's, cool. epic. it's incredibly anthemic. Um, it's got two or three choruses. Um, it's very, yeah, it's very big. It's one of the. It was. Very, it happened. For, it came together very quickly. It came together just how I wanted it to as well. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you like it. Uh, I have a good, a good feeling I will. Right now. It's great, right? I know it's good because I keep waking up with it in my head. Huh. And them are the ones, that, that's the, them are the good ones. And so people who don't know what we're talking about, so John Verveke mentioned something at the STOA uh, for like the first week of the STOA's launch. He, he just spontaneously said, we got to steal the culture. And I sent that to Akira and he loved it. And then he's creating a song and I'm just like, is it out yet? I got like a fanboy. <laughs> um, and I think... Guy in Australia being polished currently. Yeah. I've got a in Australia. Cool. And actually, Joe, Joe, you're the one that asked that question to John Verveke, uh, that inspired the question to steal the culture, and you're here. Do you want to, and you have a That's statement correct. or? That's correct. I take, yeah. I, I own that trademark. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> pass it on. You're in it's... it. You're in, I mean, if it was your voice, there's a bit where whoever asked him the question, Kind of does a response to him and that's in there it's like oh. two words, all right makes... well there you go i'm really jealous now joe that... <laughs> yeah yeah in like the middle eight bit just before the guitar solo amazing <laughs> yeah so congratulations that was a good ass question that that because what that bore out was one of those what we were just talking about that was a very pure thing that was a pure impassioned like real thing that came out of that man's head that came out of that man's face hole you know what mm -hmm. i mean that was powerful it is interesting because the next day i asked the same question to jordan hall and you know like jordan hall he gave a much more strategic and general like answer um and maybe there's something where those two maybe maybe there's something where a combination of those two answers can lead to something but um John's answer is real good. It was real good. Yeah. 
I have to hit this to uh, Jordan, formerly Greenhorse, because I do like that man. He is an epic fellow. And uh, he's coming in tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time at the STOA to do a situational assessment on the riots. So if you want to come join us, Akira, uh, feel free. Uh, oh, no, I'm streaming all day. Hmm. I wonder if I could like pull it in and like DJ over the top of it or something. <laughs> you could be the, yeah, the opening, opening act for your... Uh, Jacob, you had a question for Akira. But, but, where's Jacob? Sorry about that. So okay. you're just going back to the thing you said about, about conduits, being conduits. Yeah. And, you, and then you said conduits for whatever the hell it is. <laughs> so my question is, do you really not know what the hell it is? Or are you just glossing? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm a humble beat gardener, you know? And there's also many ways of describing this thing. And that's one of the things I've been documenting in my humble beat gardening, is that, there are, you know, the thing has many names and there are many ways of describing it. And picking one, uh, I, I don't see the point, you know? So if, if I can refer to it in a way that you understand what I'm talking about and someone else does, then, then it achieves its purpose. So just one follow-up question. I don't think JP would like that because he would say, if you want to bring it out of its blurry background, you got to name it. But Yeah, but like I said, it's got lots of different names. There's many, many different names and many people call it by different names. Am I supposed to list them all? It'd be like fucking Khaleesi in Game of Thrones. No, definitely don't list them all. <laughs> I agree with you on that. Yeah. Thanks, man. Hey, you're welcome. That's an excellent mustache. <laughs> um okay uh rogelio uh rogelio i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right you had a question uh, about Rogelio. yeah Rogelio. Okay, <laughs> there you go yeah i was just curious because uh, i'm a big fan and i was just always curious since you have to spend a lot of time having the repetition and these thoughts constantly you know going off in your head as you're editing them how much do they affect you during like the creation and editing process yeah completely I mean, they, they do completely. Uh, you become possessed by the thing. And uh, that could be good and that could be bad. If you're doing a record with David Goggins and he's constantly talking about fucking suffering, your world suddenly starts going to shit and you start having accidents and you start getting hit by fucking cars and falling off your scooter and uh, things fall on you out of the fucking sky. That, that album was a fucking ordeal. Uh, you know, the, the, the one I did recently, the Alan Watts one, was a joy. Uh, because, you know, he's talking about the duality, perception is selection, all that type of thing, uh, being able to choose, all that sort of, and he's laughing a lot. It's very fun and playful, and, and life was wonderful during the creation of that record. Uh, you know, you got to be careful with this shit, but sometimes you have to go into the dark places. The Joseph Campbell one was a split between the two, and so that had some, some uh, side effects. You know, Grant Morrison... Uh, who is a comic book writer and a friend of mine, and I've learned a lot of his processes and what have you from hanging out with him. And he wrote a comic book called The Invisibles, which was a, which was a deliberate hyper sigil designed to change the world in which the lead character was an insert of him. And he kept putting this character in situations and those things would then happen in his life two or three months later, which is how long it takes to put a fucking comic out. So it's like once it goes in the world, it gets supercharged, it seems. To the point that he had his character being tortured uh, and given essentially a flesh-eating disease, and then he got it in real life and nearly died in the same situation he put his character into. So after that happened, he started writing his character just into having orgies. And, uh, and then that's what started happening in his life. But yeah, you've got to be careful with this shit, man. Because again, as we were just saying, the closer you are to the source, uh, the closer that shit comes to uh, uh, you know, actually affecting the fucking physics of your life. Oh, thank you for your art. Hey, thank you for being there, baby. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, six. Six. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we were talking about darkness being, you know, sensitive to the darkness uh, and then that makes us, you know, inspires you to uh, create beauty uh, in the world and promote it and meaning. Uh, and then you were talking about the hyper sigil. Um, 
So can you speak maybe about that process that you're doing right now in the world, trying to make it a more beautiful place? Um, well, I, there's multiple ways of thinking about that and looking at that. Uh, Jocko Willink elocutes that very lovely in another very lovely fashion with his, uh, now that I've seen how dark it can get, I truly appreciate the light in the world. I went through a period in my artistic development of suddenly being, I did that. I don't want to know about evil. I only want to know about love. Too much darkness. Blah, blah, blah. Don't you sort of turn away from the dark, run away from the dark, getting too dark. But uh, you can't do that. You have to go all, all the way in. And then it's a case of trying to like manifest that which you wish to exist and uh, developing the tools to be able to do that and uh, do as much as you can in this little life in as useful and uh, effective a fashion as possible. And I'm kind of trying to develop tools that can transfer all these things to as many people as possible. You know, and I'm trying to do it in such a fashion that it works together and it doesn't confuse people and you don't misconstrue things, which is why I'm trying to give multiple answers to that earlier question, for example. Uh, because some things aren't going to resonate with some people and some people aren't going to understand some things and it's not necessarily until you've seen the whole of the sphere that you understand it's a sphere. You know, you can go back to the Plato's cave thing and all that. So yeah, I'm just trying to like a build a set of tools in the form of records that can people can use in their lives in order to be more useful in the world and thus have more meaningful and beautiful lives and thus that then amplifies out across the world, you know. And just as a humble beat farmer, that's my little thing that I can do. So maybe this will be the uh, last question. Uh, Aaron Rogerson, you had a question about the, Akira's previous comment about the, the sequels. If you can unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, Akira, you mentioned uh, you thought The Rise of Jordan Peterson was the first film in a trilogy, or that's how you perceived it. Yeah. What would the uh, second and third film be called in the trilogy? What would they be called? Sure, or however you want to interpret it. <laughs> oh, what happens in them? Oh, like, like Peterson Strikes Back or something. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. well, that would be it. What would you have? You'd have a rise of the Peterson. Uh, you'd have then, would you have Fall? And then uh, Revenge, which <laughs> would be titled to Return of the, because Revenge is kind of a negative word, you know what I mean? And you want to sugarcoat it a bit. I, <laughs> Um, you know, obviously the next, the album when he returns is called Resurrection and the cover is like a fist, like powering through a fucking gravestone, mm. having an infinity gauntlet with like a, late, a fucking giant energy beam coming out of it type vibes. Thank you. Not really, but yeah. You know the fucking vibes. You know the vibes. You've seen some movies and shit. She. Uh, Glenn, you had a question? Uh, we can sneak another one. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> it's a quick one. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so you got tattoos. Everyone's got meaning behind tattoos. What's the most meaningful tattoo you got, if you want to share it with us? The most meaningful? Glenn Barnett. <laughs> um, what have I got? Uh, I forget, you forget what you have, you know, um, she, oh shit, uh, I've got the, where's that, can you, that neck one, i got the, the thing from Leonard Cohen's The Future, which is very meaningful, because it's, uh, it's a kind of sigil from a Leonard Cohen record, this like, this kind of like chained bird, which is kind of in reference to the Holy Dove and how that, that is never free. But it's also uh, a reference to I was making my first album in New York at that point. And it was when I was going through that whole journey of uh, signing to a, a major record label and uh, being told I was going to be do uh, music to rap what the Beatles did and all that smoke blowing up my ass. While simultaneously knowing, having written, like a week before that happened, I'd written an article for a magazine about how major labels were unnecessary and the whole system was the devil and this, that and the other. And, um, and then I recorded them a, in retrospect, deliberately unreleasable album 
with song titles called things like Thanks for All the AIDS and what have you. And it just reminds me, of, I was like full of so much uh, love and simultaneously like rage. And I was this little, I was this kid out there in the world man, and I'd manifested everything I ever wanted and then deliberately, unconsciously, simultaneously destroyed the whole thing. And it was the right thing to do because it led me to be able to do what I'm doing now. And uh, so, yeah, I love that. And also, you know, Leonard Cohen's a bad motherfucker. And he's Canadian. What is it with Canadians? I've got so many Canadians in my cultural life. We just, we, place, we just gravitate to you, my friend. And I've never been to Canada. <laughs> I have not, not. Thanks not for yet. sharing that story, man. It sounds like you got your, uh, your hero's journal tattooed on your body. That's awesome. Yeah, I guess so. I never really thought about it that much, but yeah. And that's why I could kind of, I could talk about that for about three hours probably and go into it deeply, but in the, the Cliff Notes version, yeah, that's the vibes. Cool. So uh, time is up, uh, Kira, my friend. Uh, great, grateful for you and your existence. Uh, and I'm happy to see you looking so happy. <laughs> Thank you. That's very nice. to. Um, yeah. So I, I, I have other things to tell you, but well, I'll email you. But the link, what, what do I do there? Do I send to? Uh... Yeah, oh, if you got it, do you need it? How do I, should I post it in the chat? Yeah. All right, let me find it. Go live. Therefore, be what I just switched to another tab and Daniel Schmachtenberg's face and zoomed in massively, <laughs> like looking at me in a really sort of like unimpressed fashion. That was epic. Story of my life. What was that? Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, I love that guy. Um, but, 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 therefore, beware of virtue. Hey, look, we've got some people locked in already. Okay, where's the chat over here? Uh, direct me to how I find the chat. I just clicked that. Oh, there's more people. Hey, hey what up, Andrew Kamaromi? Oh, he, he sent it for us, I think. Uh, cool. What Michael Cillian? Look at Michael Cillian's ill hair. Yeah. He's from epic. Sweden. He's epic. Uh, where's the chat? Um, you just click chat and the zoom and you can pop it in there and the That's in the zoom. Is it down the bottom? Oh, there yeah. Is. yeah. All right. Shabba. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. There we go. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks for being back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd like to have you on my thing one of these days, if you'd like to come into my world. So Love to. Love to. All right. Boom. I've got to run over to the other side of the room. This is going to be. All right, brother. What?